So I wanted us to have a look at a few code emergencies with the focus being on code prolapse and code presentation. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at cord emergencies, specifically cord prolapse and cord presentation. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to Zambia and beyond. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. So remember that these cord emergencies are predominantly these three clinical types of abnormal descent of the umbilical cord right side by the presenting part. So they are collectively going to be called as cord prolapse. When we talk about cord prolapse, we're just simply saying that there is a descent of the umbilical cord through the cervix, either along the presenting part or past the presenting part in the presence of ruptured membranes. So if it is along the presenting part we call that is occult, the occult variant, if it is in front of the presenting part we call that is the overt variant. Remember that cord presentation is just simply the presence of the umbilical cord between the fetal part and the cervix with or without rupture of the membranes. So the overall incidence is about 0.1 to 0.6% and in the case of breach presentation it's actually much higher at about 1%. There are predominantly three main things that you really need to know with relation to these cord emergencies. We have what is known as the occult. Remember, occult means hidden, the prolapse, where you get this cord that's going to be placed right by the side of the presenting part, but it's not going to be beyond. It won't be in front of the presenting part. And you can't really feel it with your fingers. And once you do the internal vaginal examination, you can't feel it. So, But you may feel presence or sometimes absence of intact membranes. So that's what we refer to as the occult or the hidden prolapse. So here's a pictorial image to show you about the occult or hidden prolapse. Here as you can see the cord is right side or right next to the presenting part but it's not beyond the presenting part and it cannot be felt when you do your vaginal examination. Here's another clearer picture at the bottom here of, one of our occult prolapse and the membranes are still intact. Then we have our cord presentation where it's in front of the presenting part before the membranes actually rupture. So the membranes will be intact, so you can feel the cord um, in front of the presenting part, but you can't see the cord. So you can feel it on your vaginal examination, you can't see the cord. So the membranes are going to be intact and the cord is going to be in front of the presenting part. We call that as our cord presentation. Sometimes it may be pulsating, sometimes it won't be pulsating. Then we have our complete cord prolapse or uh, just simply cord prolapse where it's now going to be lying inside the vagina or it may even be at the vulva after the membranes have ruptured. So it's going to protrude through the vagina. So that's our overt cord prolapse when the membranes actually rupture. Remember that these cord emergencies are about one in 300 deliveries and they're most common in parous women, those with high parity and it's associated with weaker muscles. And the incidence is actually reduced with increased use of elective caesarean section in non-cephalic presentations. So remember, what are some of the associated factors or causes that may predispose a woman to cord prolapse? So if there's anything that's going to be interfering with the application of the presenting part or the descent of the presenting part in the lower segment of the uterus or anything disturbing the bow valve action may actually favor cord prolapse. So the factors that are going to prevent the application of the presenting part to the lower uterus and or past the pelvic brim, this are going to be predisposing to cord prolapse. And as well as associated rupture of membranes, these are going to increase the risk of cord prolapse because you don't have that sealing effect that the presenting part is ideally supposed to have as it's descending to prevent the cord from actually slipping through the cervix, slipping into the vagina. So what are some of these associated factors? We may have things that may present the hate from being engaged. So it could be an unengaged or poorly applied presenting part. It could be high parity. You should think about weak muscles. It could be an unstable lie. Again, weak muscles. 
it could be malpresentations. It's very common with transverse presentation in about 5 to 10%. It's common with breach presentation in 3%, especially with the flexed leg or foot link breach, or sometimes a compound breach in about 10% of the cases. It's also very common in a shoulder presentation. The second and associated factors are going to be related to uterine and pelvic factors. It could be a contracted pelvis, four to six, four to six times more common in these. It could be polyhydramnios, especially with rupture of membranes. It could be with placental factors, such as minor degrees of placenta previa with marginal separation of the cord, or it could be a long cord. Factors could be related to the fetus, for example, in prematurity, those that are less than 37 weeks of completed gestation, a low birth weight less than 2.5 kg, twins, especially with the second twin, and congenital malformations. It could also be iatrogenic or related clinical procedures such as artificial rupture of membrane when you have a high presenting part that's not well applied to the lower segment of the uterus. You may have malrotation of the head in occipital posterior position. You may have external cephalic version during the procedure, internal podalic version of the second twin. You may have stabilizing induction of labor. Then of course application of the fetal scalp electrodes. You may have insertion of uterine pressure transducer. Other associated factors include premature rupture of membranes, male fetuses for some reason, and anomalies of the uterus. Here's a table to actually group them into fetal or maternal characteristics that are associated with cord prolapse, as well as certain procedures associated with cord prolapse. I already alluded to these in the earlier slide. So what's our diagnosis? So we should ideally suspect cord prolapse if we see the following things. Number one, there will be some variable decelerations in bradycardia, persistent bradycardia on our CTG, especially after rupture of membranes. These are going to be indicative that the cord is actually being compressed and the fetus is actually hypoxic. The second is you're going to have these fetal bradycardias that are going to be following the fetal or, or rather fundal pressure. And again, the compression of the umbilical cord. You're going to have meconium stain liqua because this child is going to be in fetal distress. They're not going to be getting enough oxygen. So with the occult type of prolapse or the hidden type of prolapse, it's quite difficult to actually diagnose. The only thing that may lead you to suggest that a, a patient may have occult prolapse is if you have a, a, a continuous CTG monitoring or continuous electronic fetal monitoring, it's showing you this variable deceleration of the fetal heart rate. With our cord presentation, you can actually feel the pulsations of the cord through the intact membrane on vaginal examination. Then with the cord prolapse, you actually can palpate it with your fingers and its pulsations can actually be felt in if the fetus is actually alive. And remember that the cord pulsations may actually cease during the uterine contractions, but then they're going to return after the contraction actually stops. <laughs> then there is temptation actually to pull down the loop so that you can actually visualize what you're seeing and actually confirm that it's a cord. Do not do this. Any unnecessary handling of the cord should be avoided because this may cause vasospasms and it may predispose the child to being hypoxic and may worsen the situation. So if the fetus is alive, even in the absence of the cord pulsations, you must actually do a prompt ultrasound for the fetal cardiac movements or auscultate with your, for your fetal heart and you must do these things before you actually declare that the fetus has died. So what's our management? So I use the mnemonic cord to help you remember the management of cord prolapse. So C to call for help, O to organize for delivery, R to relieve the pressure, and D is of course to conduct the delivery. So we'll begin with our cord presentation. So remember here the aim is to preserve the membranes and to expedite the labor. So once we make a diagnosis we should not actually attempt to replace the cord because this is not only effective but it will also rupture the membranes and it can actually lead to the overt prolapse of the cord. So if immediate vaginal delivery is actually not a possibility or it's contraindicated then cesarean section can actually be done and during the time when you're preparing the patient for the operative delivery we keep them in a certain characteristic position that's known as the exaggerated sims position to actually minimize the cord compression. On rare occasions you may get a multipara with a longitudinal lie, having good uterine contractions and a cervix that's about seven to eight centimeters dilated without any evidence of fetal distress. So here we can actually perform some watchful expectancy and we can actually wait until the cervix is actually fully dilated when we can actually deliver the child via our forceps delivery or breech extraction. Then here's our sims position. So the patient is going to be in the lateral 
recumbent position or the lateral left lateral sims position which was named after the gynecologist j marion sims and this is actually used for rectal examination treatments is used for edemas it can be used for examining or for examining women for vaginal prolapse so the patient is actually going to be in their left lateral side and their hip is going to be their left hip is going to be and their lower extremity will be straight then of course the right hip and the knee will be bent so as you can see the right hip and the knee are going to be bent and so this sims position is also described as a person lying on their left side with both their legs actually bent then here's a image so this is a modified sims position you have actually even place a pillow underneath there and of course you can actually use the knee to chest positioning especially when you're referring the patient of course this may look a little bit awkward when the patient actually comes in so what's our management so remember that the management is going to depend on certain things number one if the baby is alive or the baby is dead number two the maturity of the baby and number three the degree of the dilatation of the cervix so generally if the baby is alive the best way to actually get them out as quick as possible is our cesarean section so this actually is going to be needed especially if the baby is alive they are sufficiently mature to actually survive if you actually extract them via c-section the fetal heart should be exculpated before you make the abdominal incision to avoid having someone get a c-section for a dead baby then of course the operation should be done as quickly as possible to deliver the baby and if vaginal delivery is actually possible the head is engaged you can actually deliver them via a forceps delivery ideally our ventus delivery is not ideal so our vacuum delivery is not ideal in these circumstances because it may take longer and if it's a breech delivery then we can do our breech extraction and if they are in transverse lie you can do the internal version and you follow this by our breech extraction the same actually applies when the head is actually not engaged in the second twin then if immediate uh, safe vagina vaginal delivery is actually not possible we may do the following things so the first aid is very important so we want to minimize the pressure to the cord at the same time we want to actually prepare the patient for assisted vaginal delivery or transfer them to a hospital that can offer c-section so remember keep them in that exaggerated sims position or the knee to chest position then we want to stop any infusion of oxytocin if she's on any infusion of oxytocin we want to give iv fluids and oxygen by face mask up to 15 liters per minute we want to fill up the bladder so this is done actually so that we can rise the presenting part and to actually prevent any compression of the cord till the time the patient can actually be delivered by the c-section or they can be delivered vaginally so the bladder can actually be filled with about 400 to 750 mils of normal saline with a Foley's catheter then the balloon is going to be inflated and the catheter is going to be clamped so remember that the bladder should be ideally emptied before the c-section and to uh, actually lift the presenting part of the cord by the gloved finger and um in, which is going to be introduced into the vagina so remember that the fingers should be placed inside the vagina till the definitive treatment is actually instituted then postural treatment with the exaggerated or elevated sims position with a pillow or wedge underneath the hip or the thigh can be done the trendelen bag position can be used or sometimes the knee to chest position may be used but then this is of course going to be tiring and irksome to actually the patient so we want to, re to re if we want to replace the cord do not do this because once we replace the cord into the vagina it's going to trigger these spasms because of the irritation and this may worsen the situation but if the baby is dead labor is actually going to be allowed to proceed and we wait for spontaneous delivery so here's our management schematic so we have a case of suspected cord prolapse so you ask yourself is the baby alive or is the baby dead you examine the woman and listen to the fetal heart if it's present or it's absent what's the maturity of the baby what's the cervical dilatation that is there so if the baby is dead of course we're going to confirm with the bedside ultrasound and we'll wait for spontaneous delivery or we can perform a destructive operation then if the baby is alive our treatment of choice ideally should be a c-section if immediate vaginal delivery is not possible then we want to offer first aid we fill the bladder then we lift the to lift the presenting part of the cord then of course we should position them in our exaggerated or elevated sims position a trandelin bex position where the legs are actually elevated or a knee to chest position and then refer them to a hospital that is equipped or we can offer our definitive management with which is our c-section if immediate safe vaginal delivery is possible we can actually perform 
uh, either a forceps delivery or ventus delivery if it's a vertex presentation the forceps delivery is advocated especially in cord prolapse then if it's in breach you want to perform a breach extraction and this should be done by an expert or a trained obstetrician or midwife so what about anticipation and early detection remember that internal examination should be done whenever the membranes actually rupture prematurely or during labor in all cases of malpresentations in twins in polyhydramnios or vertus presentation where the head is actually not engaged so surgical induction should be preferably conducted in operative theaters to keep everything ready for c-section then the uterine contractions may be initiated by oxytocin if the head is not engaged prior to you actually doing the low rupture of the membranes an internal examination should ideally be done before and after amniotomy and it should be carried out with the cord accidents in mind these cord emergencies must be kept in mind and every time you actually do this you must exclude cord presentation or cord prolapse especially in a fetus that just develops unexpected fetal distress during the labor so we want to prevent this by performing ultrasound examination for malpresentations and cord presentations avoid artificial rupture of membranes if the head is not engaged you should perform routine per vaginal examination after the spontaneous rupture of membranes they should be controlled artificial rupture of membranes in polyhydramnios to which we call stabilizing induction and of course bradycardia and variable decelerations once you note these on your ctg you must either do a vaginal examination or a speculum examination complications you know, may there's an increased risk in neonatal uh, morbidity and mortality as high as 50 percent and these are going to be attributed to hypoxia which is of course obvious because you have this cord compression by the presenting part and also due to the vasospasms of the umbilical vessels you may have operative trauma delays in transport congenital malformations as well as prematurity fetal complications remember that most of them are going to be attributed to anoxia or absolutely no oxygen that's being passed on to the fetus the moment the cord is actually going to prolapse remember that the blood flow is going to be occluded either by this mechanical compression that's going to be offered by the presenting part or due to the vasospasms of the umbilical vessels due to the exposure to the cold or the irritation when the exposed when the vessels are actually exposed outside to the valve or if they're handled or they are touched and remember that the hazards to the fetus is more in vertex presentation especially when the cord is prolapsed through the anterior segment of the pelvis or when the cervix is actually partially dilated the prognosis is related to the interval between its detection and the delivery of the baby so if the delivery is completed within about 10 to 13 minutes the fetal mortality is actually reduced by as much as 5 to 10 percent then the overall perinatal mortality is roughly around 15 to 50 percent even though most of the risks are going to be to the fetus there are some risks to the mother as well and remember that the maternal risks are rather incidental due to the emergency operative delivery especially those that are done through the vaginal route operative delivery is going to be involving risks that are, have to do with anesthesia blood loss as well as infections that have to do with the operative procedure i really hope you enjoyed this lecture on cord emergencies if you did consider subscribing to the channel hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time i post to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time bye bye